Good morning, everyone. I'm Asha Nayaswamy. These are our shelter-in-place conversations. We're in the middle of talking about the eight manifestations of God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Guru, Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dear friend Swami Kriyananda, Humbly we bow at thy feet. Bless us, that we may feel your presence inside our hearts, that we may feel your guidance inside our minds, that everything we do will be filled with the light of your presence, illuminating our inner spirit, and beaming out in helpful rays to all whom we meet. Om. Peace. Amen. So, we've been talking about the eight manifestations of God as a very practical way to understand how to live in this world, because we talk a lot about being a channel for God or being an instrument for God, but it, it gets very um, abstract. We don't really understand how to do that exactly, except by assuming an Indian accent, if our guru has an accent or something like that. Swami talked about an American ashram in the 70s where the the guru had a thick accent and a lot of the American devotees uh, assumed the thick accent, or at least traces of it, in an attempt to be like the guru. Perhaps well-intentioned, but misguided. That's not really what we're trying to do. Although, on a certain level, I can understand it. You sort of want as much as possible to tune in, but it it becomes a little confusing after a while because what happens to us when we advance spiritually is we get closer and closer to our own point of origin. In, In the creative arts, Swamiji has given really interesting advice. There was one man in particular who who was a very gifted musician and he wanted to compose let me phrase it differently, Adananda, especially at that time, but really all the way through, the body of music that we draw upon, which is quite extensive, is the repertoire created by Swami Kriyananda or by Master himself. And we we have a few other songs in that repertoire, um, either traditional from India or traditional from other sources, and a few songs that have been written by members of Ananda over the years. There's no rule against songs created by others, it's it's just that there's a very specific vibration that comes through the music of Swamiji and Master, and it's part of our sadhana to be in tune with that vibration. And music has a tremendous influence. So if we move over into music that is different from that vibration, may have a perfectly valid vibration, but is too different from us, it takes us out of tune with the particular ray of grace we're trying to do. We have to understand that music is part of our sadhana, just in the same way that we practice Kriya, instead of the Kriya as taught by Lahiri Mahashaya, as we've learned it through Ananda. We practice that particular technique, not because there's no other valid techniques in the world, but this is the one that puts us in tune with our ray of grace. And the music that we we sing and listen to, for the most part, is the same, because everything is sadhana. Music is there to change our consciousness, not just to entertain us. So it's not a sin to like some other kind of music. But in the context of Ananda, we, we, we stay pretty much in our own ray there. Um, and this young man wanted, he, he wrote songs, and he wanted, uh, basically he wanted Swami to endorse him uh, uh, sort of going out into the world and writing his own music and becoming a musician on his own. And Swami was by no means trying to suppress the man. He, he wanted to help him. But Swami was astute enough to see, and this is what he said, he said, the music you're writing now is imitative. And he was imitating, I believe, John Denver was the famous one at that time. And this man's music resembled that music. Swami said, if you get deeper in tune with the music that, that Swamiji and Master have written, then you will get closer to your own point of origin. And then from your own point of origin, you will write original music. 
instead of imitative music. And Swami has commented that often in art, people think to be original, you have to be rebellious against what's going on. If everybody else likes beauty, then you make your art ugly. If everybody else likes melody, then you don't make your art without melody. But that's also imitative, it's just reactive. Original is when the divine literally gives you your own unique song to sing. And then there's power in it. And it doesn't necessarily, it won't even necessarily become part of what we would call the Ananda repertoire because it actually might be a different ray. There was a woman who was part of our, our spiritual family, wrote really wonderful music, exceedingly original, but it was her expression. And so it never really, I mean, it's not like, there are, there are, there is some administrative oversight for this, but really it's actually more just spontaneous. It's like if it matches, it kind of ends up being part of it. And if it doesn't, it always stays a little on the side. It has its fans, but it's a little on the side. So what I'm coming to in the context of what I'm talking about now, but let me just finish for a minute. Creative self-expression is a, is a very important part of the spiritual path, of the spiritual path as, as Master taught it and as Swami expressed it. It's part of the, the Dwapar Yuga. It's part of the new way of, of being a de- dedicated to God is that we transcend the ego by allow, allowing ourselves to fully express and then learning that it's not the ego that it's expressing, but it's the divine su- through us. The opposite end of that, which has been the Kali Yuga way, you know, most typically expressed by the Catholic monastic ideal, in which the e- ego, egoic self-expression is completely suppressed in an attempt to sort of break the ego and, and get out of it. The problem is that suppression is uh, sometimes has bad consequences. And so does self-expression if it just goes to the ego. But in, in, in this path that we're following, creative self-expression is actually quite fundamental. Um, the, art, the artist is a channel. Art is a hidden message, self-realization. I mean, self-expression, artistic creativity is a path to self-realization. That's part of what we do. But you have to be deep inside yourself so that you can really be expressing yourself with a capital S. Really be an instrument of the divine getting to your origin point. Now, how this relates to what we're talking about today is when we talk about these eight manifestations of God, these are the ways that the divine actually flows through everyone but when we tune into these particular eight expressions, it takes us deep into our origin point. And so even though we're, we're living a, a shared reality, it, it becomes uniquely our own when we have made it our own. This is the idea of spiritual life as Swami expressed it. It isn't something that you put on from the outside. We don't look around and see how we're supposed to behave and then try to behave that way. I've, I've lamented in many ways. I mean, it, change is inevitable. And, and there's, there's the time when things are the way, your, your ideal way, and then time passes and they move. I was very touched by this woman's house I visited. Um, she, she was a, about my age by that point. Um, Her children had long since grown, and she had three portraits of her three children on prominent display in her house. And they were all when the children were under 10. And they were fairly close in age, so they were all like, like that. But it was like that was when the children were still children and belonged to her. And that was her, that was her happiest memory, because after that, they became a little more problematic. (laughs) As my father put it to me with no little poignancy. The child disappears into the adult. So as Ananda has developed, and we've, we've sort of developed even more of a culture, a visible culture, people can observe how they're supposed to behave and then behave that way. And that's not the same as feeling it from inside your heart and doing it because it's your nature to do so. Swamiji even went so far in a certain context when he was talking about the membership process for a residential community, especially the village. He said, don't write out, don't give people a list of what's expected to them, of them, because then they will simply meet your expectations. 
He said, just let them do what they would naturally do and notice what they do. And that's, that's the way you can tell whether people are suitable or not. Now, of course, again, you can do such things when you're small and decisions can be made. Everything can be decided very personally by intuition. Everything changes. Now, coming back, which is, I really am in a, going in a straight line here, the quality we're talking today ab- about is calmness. And what we, what we really have to understand about all eight of these, and now we're speaking about calmness, is yes, of course, one can discipline oneself to be calm. But what we're really talking about when we're talking about manifesting the divine is not that we discipline ourselves to behave in a certain way, although that's generally better than just coming apart at the seams and letting whatever happens to be at the top just boil over onto the stove. That's not such a good plan either. But what we really want to do is we want to find that quality within us and then act from that quality because we have actually become in tune with it. And that's why we have these eight manifestations because it may be that you you have no attunement with love. You're just you're in a situation where you don't love anything about it, but we haven't come to it yet, but you can still put out energy. So you find energy within yourself, and that's how you manifest God in that situation when love is simply not accessible to you. If the only quality you had to manifest was love, then you would have to say, Oh, I just love that you came to visit me today. I'm just so happy to see you and your 16 undisciplined children. Yes, come in and wreck my house. You know, (laughs) like that is not a very authentic expression of spirituality. But instead you can say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I was just setting out for the park. Let me just get some crackers and cheese and we'll take you and your 16 undisciplined children to the park. (laughs) You know, you might not love anything about it but you can manifest God as energy at that point. And then you can even enjoy the fact that these 16 undisciplined children are wrecking the park and not your home, and a certain amount of happiness can set in. But it all has to be spontaneous. At least that's the goal, and that's why we have eight. You run through them really fast and just see which one is going to work. Now, calmness, which we're working today, is it's, the interesting thing is that Peace and calmness are two separate realities. And yesterday we talked a lot about peace. And of course, they cross each other. When you become very peaceful, you tend to become very calm. So the contrast is actually from the other side. You can be in the midst of absolute chaos. Everything can be the antithesis of peaceful. And still you can find calm in it. And that's where the real power of calm comes from. The most notable, powerful example of this is often the stories that people will tell after they come off of a battlefield, especially when people have been exceedingly heroic on the battlefield. There's often a a realization when they reflect upon it just about how completely calm they were in a situation in which literally their life was threatened and the people around them were dying. I mean, the the consequences were anything but peaceful. I mean, the consequences might have been catastrophic. But, but that kind of divine calm that settles in on you is, is, can be the result of absolute one-pointed focus. I, of course, in this lifetime, have never been on a battlefield. Um, and God willing, I never will be. Um, probably... I have past lives as a soldier, but I, it doesn't. It's not. It's not something that resonates deeply with me. I tend to identify as female, and so I tend to my, the images even of my past lives tend to be female. Whether that's really, you know, really a, a cosmic truth or not, I don't know. But I know what it is to be in a situation where you see there's only one goal. There's only one place that we're going. And everyone around you might have a completely different idea, but there's just one place that you're going and you know it's going to work. I was very interested, and and this is not by no means battlefield, but this was a very interesting interview I heard on the radio by the man who, uh, now I'm I'm not probably going to mess this up a little because the science is obscure to me, but he he mapped the human uh, genome, is that the right word? The human genes. He, He did something scientifically where he, he, he was able to uh, 
document this huge chain that has to do with the way the genetics work in the human being. And apparently, this was quite a, an unusual thing to have done, and, and there was a lot of, of kerfuffle when this man set out to do it, whether, you know, that he was going to accomplish this. And so the interviewer was saying to him, you know, were you disturbed by all the criticism that came and so on? He said, not at all. And he just said really simply, I knew I could do it. It's just like he had tapped into something inside himself. It wasn't even that I knew I could do it, because that's not how he said it. I knew it could be done, is what he said. I knew it could be done. They didn't believe it could be done, but I knew it could be done. And so it was that calm determination that who cares what they're saying around me? I know it can be done. When Thomas Edison had to find a filament that would work for his electric bulb, I believe it was hundreds and hundreds of of failed experiments before he found the one that would work. And all the people around him were just telling him that he was just crazy, that this was a bad idea, that he needed to shift, but he knew it could be done. He just knew it was out there, and he knew it was just a matter of him just steadily moving forward, eliminating all the options that were wrong, and that he would find it. And that kind of calm determination, which is really much more much more of a, a practical uh, understanding of calm than being a hero on a battlefield, although I was going to speak of it from the point of view of a hero on a battlefield, the at least the dramatic images that I have, and this is why I was saying I'm not drawing this even from my own past life memories, but you're you know you're there on the battlefield and there's your objective. And between you and your objective, there's a whole lot of people who don't want you to reach it, who are just as determined that you not reach it as you are that you're going to reach it. And all you see is where you're going. And you just don't see. Yeah, you know that they're there because that would be unrealistic not to know that they're there. You know that there's certain amount of kind and quality of energy, kind, a quality and quantity of energy is going to have to be put out to get to that goal. And so the, but, but you're not deterred, you're not agitated, and your focus is not on those obstacles. Those obstacles are, are merely there to be moved aside to get where you're going. And see, in all of this, you can hear and you can feel that calmness is, is the opposite of passive. And calmness is the opposite of low energy. It's the opposite of giving up. So when people say, calm down, calm down, calm down, sometimes what they're trying to tell you is to give up. No, I'm not about to give up. But I don't have to be agitated in my determination. This is not quite calmness, but it's an illustrative story. There was a point in the development of the building of Ananda during the first year when Swami Kriyananda was earning the money almost single-handedly, to, to buy land and, bu- and build the first buildings so that, that we could launch, so that we could launch with something in place without debt, a temple, a dining room, a kitchen, a, a home for himself, a, a reception office. Those were the, they were all geodesic domes that he was building. And he was just putting out absolutely everything he had into it and was, you know, pushing his physical and mental and even his spiritual strength to the limit to do it. And then he was he had made an arrangement with a certain company to pay off a bill um, in, in installments, but there was no contract. It was a verbal arrangement. And suddenly, whoever that uh, merchant was, he saw that he, saw that he could uh, put a lien on the property and, and get, his, get the property because the bill was unpaid. So Swamiji suddenly had uh, like another five or six thousand dollars, which in in today's money is not that much, but in that money it was a lot. Because Swami like charged like twenty five dollars for a six week class series, so that kind of gives you an idea of the economy that we're working on. He had about three hundred students, which helped, but still the economy we're working with is pretty small. Um, and he really didn't know what, what he was going to do. And he was with a friend. He was in his car, and he was extremely intense about it. And and uh, the friend said to him, well, you know, why don't you come over to the house, and we'll have a cup of tea, and you'll feel better. So Ami's response was, I don't want to feel better. I have to figure out what I'm going to do. And so 
calm down often means give up. And people of, of determined willpower are not going to give up. But we're much more likely to make good decisions if we're not agitated and afraid. So what we have to practice in ourselves, and this is like everything else that I've talked about, you cannot wait until the emergency. You cannot wait until your child's life is at stake. You cannot wait until your own life is threatened or your own well-being is threatened to have the habit of bringing your consciousness back to calmness. So I've, I've spoken of these eight manifestations as sort of reaching for the positive one that you're able to manifest. But the other side of it is to use these as an antidote to wrong action, to wrong attitude, to wrong behavior. And a lack of calmness is a wrong behavior. And it's wrong not because it's a sin and I don't think it's on... I don't think it's on Moses' tablets. I don't think he chipped it into stone. Be thou calm. Thou shalt always be calm. But it's wrong because it messes up our lives. When we're not calm, we do dumb things. It's just as simple as that. Our mind becomes clouded and it becomes agitated. We, 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 we lose our patience. We become panicked. And we just do, we make, we make mistakes that just tumble down the hill and cause, you know, and and the rock crashes into other parts of our lives too and just can make a big mess. So calm down. Actually, probably what we want to say is calm up. <laughs> just calm up. Make yourself calm by remembering the bigger picture. Um, it, it, uh, when uh, What happens to us is not that perspective may not change the facts of what you're dealing with, but they can change your relationship to those facts. I think of it this way, when, when something, when a difficulty arises, it tends to invade every, every inch of your perception. It's like your whole brain and, your, and all your senses fill up with it. Or another way of putting it is if you, if you put your hand really close to your eyes and then open your eyes, all you can actually see is your hand. Now, the whole world is still out there, but because you put your hand uh, so close to your eyes, you can't really see anything of the world. And whatever issue is represented by your hands appears to be the entire reality. But if you even just extend your hand out in front of you, it's still your hand. It still has all the same characteristics. But even as you look at it, you're aware of the fact that there's a, a giant world all around it. And so it doesn't panic you as much. It doesn't just seem like the only thing you're dealing with. You remember all the other resources that you have and all the other uh, realities so that even if the worst expectation of what your hand represents proves to be true, it's still only part of. It's only part of who you are. So to calm up is to get perspective. And we can't get perspective when we're in a panic. It's just by definition we can't. So even putting out energy, if that energy is not calm, that energy could, in fact, make a lot more trouble rather than less trouble for you. And this is where the different eight elements play together. We have to draw on wisdom. You know, wisdom and calmness are a nice team because when we're not feeling calm, often wisdom will help us calm up because we'll be able to think, okay, I faced a lot of difficulties before and God has always gotten me out of it. Okay, even if the worst happens, you know, there's there's life goes on. You know, this does seem like the only reality, but there's so many other parts of my life that are still working that even if this one crashes, we'll find a way to go on. Everything happens for a purpose. Divine Mother is giving me a gift in this. And all of this allows us not merely to affirm calmness or squelch our panic, it actually allows us to go behind it and, and to our point of origin. And that's where I started this whole discussion this morning, is our point of origin. So every time something happens that causes us to be slightly alarmed and to lose our calmness, we need to, to develop the habit of going back to our point of origin. What do I find at my point of origin? In the context of, 
uh, well, I've been giving a lot of broadcasts, so I don't know how recently I said this, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm repeating myself. But when I was about two years old, riding in the back of the car with my parents, before my younger sister was born, it was just my brother and I, and my brother was exceedingly clever, and was, and he enjoyed teasing me. I enjoyed being teased, but not always. Somehow or another, there was a kerfuffle in the back seat, and my mother was very stern with us, and she was very stern with me, and my feelings got hurt. And there were no seat belts in those days, and I crawled onto the floor of the car, and I curled up on the floor with my head on the bump that was between the two sides of the back seat, and I began to tune into the turning of the tires. I mean, all, looking at this from my present perspective, I'm, I know it was a yogic memory of listening to the Om and knowing it would calm me down. But what was really yogic was my actual thoughts at the time, which I remember. It's interesting, the pieces of our childhood that stick with us. This is a vivid memory, one of my very earliest. I, I knew that my mother, I, I, I knew that I deserved to be scolded. So it wasn't like I was mad at my mother for being unfair. You know, my brother and I got completely out of hand. There was no question about it. But it had hurt my feelings, and I didn't like being hurt. I didn't like being unhappy. And I knew that, that if I went deep inside myself, I would reach the place where everything was just fine and what my mother had said and done would just be a sort of a distant echo compared to my reality at the moment. And so I lay down on the floor listening to the Om to go, which I understand now, to my point of origin. Because my point of origin was going to be, I couldn't have said the presence of God, but it was a quality of consciousness that was far more desirable than allowing myself to get ping-ponged around like a, tossed around like a ping-pong ball by my mother's opinion, my brother's teasing, and all these different things. No, 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 I don't need any of that. I can go into myself. So we, what we need to practice is calming up every time we get a little agitated by, not by having a cup of tea, although tea is nice, but by going into our point of origin and seeing this in a bigger perspective. Would God have sent this to me if it wasn't for my own good? Would God have sent this to me without also sending me a solution that if I can just center in enough, I'm sure that I will see? even if this proves to be as catastrophic as it appears to me uh, to appears to be appears to me to be now even that must be the will of god breathe in breathe out move that move the panic move the hand away from the eye so that we can get a bigger perspective and then once there's a little more relationship to a higher truth then I can look at the situation and decide what, what it is for me to do. You know, and sometimes we have to do something active. I, I swim for exercise, but I also swim to keep my mind calm. And on more than one occasion when my, I, my mind was not willing to calm down, I would, as I put it, throw myself into the swimming pool. And the primary reason that would work, swimming has a calming effect on my whole system, but I also I swim with a snorkel, and therefore I do long, deep, regular breathing. And so by exercise, sometimes if you can if you can put yourself in a state of regular, deep breathing, then that act, action alone will calm you down. Therefore, you can sing, um, you can do pranayams, you can do actual exercises to calm yourselves up. And then you'll actually change both your physiology and your mental state. And you'll be, and you'll also be manifesting God. Literally, you're manifesting God when you become calmer. I mean, and that's very comforting, isn't it? Because that's just what we want to do. We want to be an instrument of the divine. And there's also that mysterious word. We want to be in tune with God. And to be in tune with God is to manifest the vibration that is divine. So calming yourself up is actually to get in tune with God. That's why even something as mundane as swimming or running or brisk walking or pranayam, controlling your, the flow of your breath, that's putting you in tune with God because calmness is a manifestation of God. 
You see how beautifully it can work together? And then from that, you can choose your response rather than be compelled to a reaction. And you can act from your point of origin and do that which is really intended for you to do. So my friends, I hope this is helpful. God bless you.